Coming up on this episode of the Delta Huddle podcast. The CX works best when it's uh, something of an octopus uh, that just like reaches out and and has uh, tentacles in every department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but especially marketing and, and sales, um, there's a lot you can uncover about what does and doesn't actually need to be fixed in your product. Um, by by integrating your CX and your your marketing really well, um, so that you know if 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 the CX team says like oh, you know customers are consistently confused about this issue, and you bring that to the product and the engineering teams, and they're like I don't understand why they're confused about it. It's like it seems pretty straightforward to me. And then you talk to sales and marketing, and they're like oh we're <laughs> we're marketing yeah. that wrong. Oops, uh, sorry, yeah. we didn't fully understand that. Um, I mean, it's we laugh, but it's, that's the exact conversation has happened uh, in my career a couple of times. So, hey, welcome back to the Delta Huddle podcast by Center Code. I'm Stefan Centers. Now, across the Delta Huddle podcast, we've discussed two areas that really benefit from beta testing: that being support and customer success. And one other area that really, really benefits from getting the voice of your customer in early is customer experience. Now, customer experience is much more than just how the customer interacts with your product. It also extends to how they interact with your entire organization, whether that's reaching out to support for help or working with sales to get more of your product. In today's episode, we talk to Colin Flanagan, Director of Customer Experience at Sage. Now, in Colin's 10 years as a CX leader, he's helped fight churn, create seamless experiences for customers, and really strengthen the voice of the customer across organizations. Now, during our conversation, we talked about how trends are changing in customer experience, how surprise and delight is suddenly out the door, um, why it's best to be transparent in a customer experience environment across your entire organization, and how tracking the customer's journey is essential for building a really great customer experience. Colin shared a lot of wisdom in an area that we don't usually tackle on the Delta Huddle podcast, so I'm really excited to share his insights and his knowledge with you today. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and here is Colin Flanagan. Well, Colin, thank you so much for joining us today on the Delta Huddle podcast. Uh, it's great having you on. Um, usually we have people who are very entrenched in uh, kind of running beta programs and beta testing. Um, but it's really wonderful to have you on because you kind of give us the unique perspective of working in customer experience. Um, so to kick things off, I'd love to hear about um, more about yourself, really, um, and how you got started in customer experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited to be here and, and chatting with y'all. Um, so I've been working in CX uh, as a CX professional of, of varying levels for about 12 years now. Um, I'm currently the director of customer experience at uh, a learning and development coaching company called Sage. Uh, but before that, I, I worked at uh, I've worked in fintech, I've worked in HR tech, uh, been in a, a consultant before. Um, and actually, my first job in support uh, in in CX was um, for a consulting company called uh, they were called Co Support when I was working with them, um, and. The way I usually explain it to people is we we did um, almost like uh, kitchen nightmares or uh, or like bar <laughs> rescue or whatever. Uh, we did that, but for places uh, that had like really awful uh, customer experience, mm -hmm. and reached out to us and said like, "Hey, we need help. Like, please come in and help us reset." So you know, we did things like we did everything. We wrote their rewrote documentation. We um, we retooled experiences. We you know, got them set up with support platforms and and even ran support with them uh, for them. Um, you know, as sort of like a, a, a an outsourced support uh, org for them, and then like we would train people as they they came in, uh, hired hired folks. So, um, yeah, it was a really really great way to kind of like dive headfirst into the world of CX, um, and then eventually join a company that I felt really uh, really excited about. One of my last contracts I worked for them, um, I just kind of stayed uh, because the company said, like, we'd like to have you forever. I said, I'd like to be here <laughs> for a long time. Um, yeah. So it, it, it worked out and I was their, their director of, uh, of CX before I left running tech support, um, customer support, customer success, all that, all that stuff. 
Um, and, uh, and now I'm at Sage and yeah, I learned a lot over the years. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's always lovely to hear, you know, like, Hey, can you be our forever director of, of this department? Right. right? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's yeah. uh yeah. Rarely a bad thing to hear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and for people in our audience who may not know, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what customer experience and CX really entails? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I already mentioned, uh, like some of the disciplines, but, um, there's a breakdown I, I often like to give people, um, and folks in the tech audience, I think, will largely probably understand this. But mm-hmm. um, you know, your basic roles are customer success, um, customer support, customer service, uh, technical support, product support, those sorts of uh, of things. That's what entails. Uh, community management also um, is a big part of uh, of customer experience overall. Um, and the the breakdown I usually give people um, for don't. For, for folks who don't totally understand the difference between, say, support and success and service, like, isn't that all the same thing? Um, the difference is, putting it in, like, overly simplistic terms, uh, in my experience, at least, customer service is what you set up and roll out uh, when you have a product uh, or platform that has things, like, things that are broken that you're not going to fix. Um, you set up customer service to like give people refunds and discounts and things like that. Um, and that's, that's customer service. Um, it's not necessarily good customer service, but it's customer service anyway. Um, and then you have customer success, which is kind of like this weird valley between sales and account management um, and renewals and account management. But either way, it's still basically account management. Um, and then like post sales, uh, and then customer support is the better, uh, cousin of customer service where, um, you have problems that you actually want to fix, uh, and customers come to you and tell you about them. And then you have a team that says like, great, here's this workaround, or here's how I can solve that for you. Or, you know, let me pass this on to, to tech, su- tech support or engineering or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then you're you're using that as uh, ideally um, a a really excellent like feedback loop uh, to to improve your products and your services all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of our guests uh, previously who are now you know running beta programs or um, you know are you know thrust into the world of beta, um, it seems like they really get their start in support. So I can see how yeah. those two fields really mesh well together it's almost kind of like you're naturally adjacent to it so you just sort of end up like hey you know let's get a support person to run our beta because they sort of know the the ins and outs of what people may want absolutely yeah yeah Um, they tend to they tend to have this like ability to be personable with users which is really good (laughs) Uh, and also have some technical ability which is also very good yeah Um, so that helps. Uh, and I find too that like, you know, I, I've worked at several companies where, um, you know, ideally you've got a, a, some version of a, of a, of an always on beta program. If you're like able to dog food your product, uh, really well. Um, but I've worked at companies where like, you can't really dog food the product. Um, but a good CX team with a healthy imagination can like kind of imagine how it would go if you, if you were, if that makes sense. Yeah, we have yeah. we have this weird. I don't want to say snake in its own tail. It's just a weird situation. We sell a software for running beta tests. Huh? Um, our support people don't run beta tests. We have a team of people that run beta tests, but not necessarily our beta tests for our company. Um, so dog fooding is a little odd. Uh-huh. Um, so we've come up with some creative s- situations to get those support people in there to like, this is what it's like to manage a test or, or be as a tester. And that way they get to learn the product firsthand through the eyes of someone managing a test or, or not. But I, I think that's actually how I found Colin. Colin posted something and I saw one of our customers respond to his post. And there's a conversation about, um, who should be involved? I think it was who should be involved in um, a beta program, or what what program should be CX be involved in? And I saw Colin say, "Yeah, CX should be involved in in beta programs." I'm like, "Yeah, 
cool. I love that I've I've pitched <laughs> that for a while, like, and that's why I got like this connection. Like, hey, dude, let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to get his take. So I'm, yeah. I'm in, uh, let's re- rehash that story just on in in public, Colin. Yeah. yeah um, well, and, and something you you something I think we we both agreed on when we talked initially about that that is uh, is worth touching on too is like. I certainly wouldn't say it's true that everybody um, in CX or like everybody on your CX team is like a person you should tap on the shoulder uh, for for a beta testing program, right? Some mm-hmm. some folks are going to veer more on the side of like just being good at talking to the customers and less good at the the technical side of things. Um, <laughs> but I think it, it it definitely should be an open and perhaps even a revolving door, um, so that even those folks who who aren't as good with the tech side of things or, or aren't as good at debugging can still like kind of come in and say like, mm, that seems off. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll, we'll get to that. I'm sure you have uh, uh, more questions that can get us deeper into that conversation. <laughs> Plenty of other ones, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mike was talking about that. Mike Fine, he's our senior test manager and he helped co-found Center Code. We had him on a while back and he was talking about like, at least for himself, he's like, as many people as I can get into a beta program is great for me. He he loves having everyone listening in. And like you said, you know, you may not have those technical audiences in there who are strictly there to see like, oh, you know, the code is not right on this or we keep running into this cr- bug that keeps crashing or something like that, but they can still see the ideas and the praise and the sentiments that are coming forward and kind of the the voice of the customer. So, uh, that seems to be really really valuable um, in the world of beta testing and kind of how it uh, melds together with customer experience. Um, kind of coming back to that a little bit, um, you know, we see trends in pretty much every industry and it seems like they're changing constantly all the time, you know, faster and faster and faster, you know, the more time goes on. What are some of the trends that you've seen in customer experience that are kind of new or changing or, you know, something was a paradigm and all of a sudden it's, you know, shuffled away? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, things have changed so rapidly since I started, um, Mm -hmm. One of the big things uh, I remember from when I first jumped in um, was sort of like an in pro- in process uh, trend where um, it was counterintuitive for a lot of companies because they we would we would tell them this I remember uh, in my in my consulting days and they would be like what are you talking about because we would come in and we would say hey um, the first thing that you need to do is stop providing phone support and you know, somebody somewhere would like start pulling their hair out and going like, that's, I can't believe you said, you just said that. Like people want to talk to us on the phone. Um, and, and then we would sit down and we would explain like, no, they don't want to talk to you on the phone. That's just where they get results because your email support sucks and it takes a ton of back and forth and extra hours because you don't, you don't have a person right there. Um, so what they really want is a fast solution, not a phone call. Uh, they want to talk to you via email. That uh, is, is one cha- trend that's that's certainly changed in the past uh, ten years since I've been doing this. Is that um, now live chat, uh, texting, social media? Um, I, I'd say predominantly live chat is probably the most popular channel for most customers, um, at least right now. Uh, but social, well, social is kind of all over the place because social media is kind of all over the place as a marketplace right now, but. <laughs> um, social and texting are, are kind of like neck and neck. Um, but it's because they're, they're fast and they're conversational. And that's another, uh, another big trend is that, um, you know, that was one of the other first things we jump in and tell people is like business language is out. Don't, don't do that. Just like talk to people like they're people. Um, now I come in and work with teams on how to do that with, uh, with AI and language learning, learning models for their, like their chat bots. Um, because like nobody likes talking to a robot and nobody likes talking to a human that sounds like a robot. Um, you know, I think some other things too that are, that are kind of counterintuitive. Um, I tend to give customers a little bit more credit these days, especially in the SaaS world, um, for being, there's this really delicate line you walk between like, uh, treating a customer like they have the technical acumen to get a thing done and also explaining it like they're five. Um, you know, it's a really, really delicate tightrope, but, but it can be done. 
Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's one of those skills that that makes people really, really excellent at, at CX. And like, I hire for that. Um, you know, I ask people like, explain something complicated to me, um, and then I watch how they do it and see, you know, whether or not they make me feel dumb uh, as they're explaining yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so I think like you can you can you can trust that your customers are going to be a little bit more tech savvy and a lot more expectation averse because we live in a world now where. Um, you know, if, if I send them, you know, a, a, a video of like, go here in your account and click this button and then click that button and then click this button there, it, depending on the product, the response might be like, oh, okay, great. Or it might be like, well, why aren't you just doing that for me? Like, why are you giving me things to click, mm-hmm. dude, go and fix it. So that's another yeah. interesting challenge. Um, the last big one I, I would mention too is, is, um, is just self-serve. Um, again, it's it, it. I think it's less counterintuitive now because people like me uh, have been out there like banging that drum for 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 ten years now. But um, customers don't. It's the same. It's the same thing as as phones, right? If I have the option to not talk to somebody to solve a problem I'm having, because I can just solve it myself, I'm going to do that. That sounds great. Um, so the rise of like self-serve and really deep, rich, like, uh, immersive self-serve experiences, um, is another big trend that I think we're going to see, especially with AI being as popular as it is right now. Like we're going to see more and more and more of that, um, moving along in, in the future. Um, and a lot more people on the back end, like constantly tinkering, uh, on those experiences to make them really rich and interesting. Very nice. Yeah. And it seems like kind of the more uh, less friction that we can have. Right. You know, obviously someone doesn't want to be sitting on the phone, you know, waiting for 20 minutes for a representative to get to them. You know, they'd much rather just go and like, I mean, there's a box right there and I can just type in my question and, you know, someone will get back to me. Cool. That's fine. So, yeah, uh, it seems like those experiences seem to be taking over a lot and, uh, you know, uh, more engaging as well seems to be kind of the trend that I'm seeing. Um, Yeah. uh, Have at least in your experience, um, what are some of the programs that you guys have, have done to kind of discover those trends? Did you do you know, voice of the customer or any kind of uh, uh, panel testing, anything like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, I've done, um, well, I've, I've helped run um, dog fooding prog- programs. Um, I've helped run internal internal beta testing before to, to kind of gain internal insights. I've, I've helped do... Um, guess you could call them focus groups um before and like customer <laughs> research research initiatives uh that's probably a better term they weren't mm-hmm. traditionally folk, focus groups close to not quite um and then yeah uh, uh voice of the customer programs i think are critical at this point to a business's success like if you don't if you don't have one now and you're listening like think about it um because there's probably somebody at your company that could they could run it uh and do a fairly decent decent job um you know the the really basic things to do um that most folks will tell you is like you know tag your tickets um focus on themes focus on on tones um there are a couple of different like different methods um that i've enjoyed using to do this there's one um that goes way back um Hopefully I'm not, I, I might be dating myself even by, by bringing it up, but it's called the rough, <laughs> the rough method. Um, okay. it's, it, it's, um, Sean Kramer at Atlassian, uh, is where I heard about it. There, there was like a, a talk he gave, um, at a conference a long time ago. Um, but the, the general framework is that every ticket, every customer communication you see, you come in, that you see come in, um, you label as either a reliability, a usability, or a uh, functionality issue. And that's that's rough. Um, and the nice thing about that is that's something I recommend to, to folks who are like just getting started pulling uh, customer data and customer insights out of their, their, their comms because that's a really nice like broad view of well, where where are the deepest issues in our product? Is it is it reliability, which is like you know downtime or, or bugs? Is it is it usability? which can be usability is a broad category. This is one of the downfalls of that method um, because usability could be like uh, this feature is hard to use, could be this feature is hard to figure out, 
could be uh, I'm I'm misunderstanding marketing really hard uh, and we mm-hmm. need to go fix that. And it might not even be a problem with the product. Um, and then, of course, there's there's functionality, which is like most of the times I've done that program, it's it's code for feature requests. That's roughly all that lands in, <laughs> into functionality. But still, um, it's it's a really nice, like clean method to kind of separate things out and then dive deeper from there. Um I think also that's something that uh, that I've done a lot of is um, working directly. CX works best when it's uh, something of an octopus uh, that just like reaches out and and has uh, tentacles in every department. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially marketing and and sales, um, there's a lot you can uncover about what does and doesn't actually need to be fixed. In your product, um, by by integrating your CX and your your marketing really well, um, so that you know if 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 the CX team says like oh, you know customers are consistently confused about this issue, and you bring that to the product and the engineering teams, and they're like I don't understand why they're confused about it. It's like it seems pretty straightforward to me. And then you talk to sales and marketing, and they're like oh we're <laughs> we're marketing yeah. that wrong. Oops, uh, sorry, yeah. we didn't fully <laughs> understand that. Um, I mean, it's we laugh, but it's, that's the exact conversation has happened uh, in my career a couple of times. So, um, so I think that really helps. And then again, just using your your CX team and all of your your challenge channels as as an always on focus group um, in and of itself. Like ultimately, if you're running CX well, that's what that is. It's 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 a, a constant report on the status of your customer's health, their understanding of your product, their ability to use it. Um, That's actually another trend that um, it's fairly recent. I think it was in, I I read it in um, a a trends report from Zendesk um, just Mm -hmm. this year. But um, CX teams are, I'm really excited to see this as a trend because this is something I've been excited about for years. Um, They're really starting to embrace uh, merging data sets between okay. you know um the hot jars of the world you know your your customer monitoring software is to see what people are using and where the where the um where the friction is um uh, potentially tools like you all uh to be honest um i don't know what you have yeah. in terms of monitoring but but um merging that with uh with your cx data to find meaningful patterns and uh help inform both teams of how, how y'all can support each other. Yeah. yeah. One of my, one of my favorite interactions with, with CX and it's kind of like along those, those what interests are piqued my interest is when we do beta tests, we find things that are wrong with it. We find things that we need to improve, but there's no way we're going to fix all of it. Right. There's, there's no way we're like a couple months before launch and no product manager is like, yep, we got to fix all this. We're going to d- delay the launch. And it's just not going to happen. There's no world with that. So you fix the big things, fix the really big things that would have caused a huge headache. And then you have all this other stuff, right? You have all this other feedback. And it's like, that's not, don't just throw it away, right? Yeah, just so. don't throw that and say, yeah, that's that's done. So a lot of teams that I, I see that that find good impact with their results shift that those things like uh, what's broken or bad experiences or things that need workarounds over to that CX team and say, enable your live chat, enable your um, self-serve with oh. this stuff. This is the problems that people are running into before we launched, right? Yeah. <laughs> Give them that data set to use and say, hey, you should have articles for these things. That way you're not having to pick up a phone or look at the email because they can self-serve themselves. Or you can get off that phone a little bit faster or get through chat faster or mm-hmm. anything like that. You uh, you bring up a really good point there. And um, there's a principle I'm a really big fan of at uh the places I work in, um, which I like to refer to as translation, it's not translation. It's it's just like value swapping. Um, but I'm a big proponent of like speaking the other department's language when you're trying to work with mm-hmm. them. And one of one of the best ways um, that I've seen for uh, folks in in beta testing or engineering or or what have you to to sort of educate CX leaders about like even what it is they do. Um, is to to help them test uh, channel accessibility for user mm-hmm. outreach. 
um, because chances are, you know, if you haven't looked at it in in six months, uh, you might be missing out on customer feedback or even customer inquiries because your chat bot is too hard to like get past to get through to an actual person or your help yeah. buttons are in a weird obscure place or the icon is just a question mark and not a not the word help and so people aren't reaching out um that's a really great way to like introduce ideas like you know a b testing and um and uh and, and things like that to kind of like test things out and see okay what what does volume do if we make these changes um and just introducing them to testing concept concepts based on that and then you know the end benefit result is that you've got you've got more volume um and thus more customer insights and you're 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 probably reducing churn like you know the benefits are endless yep. yeah, absolutely um it accessibility for me is definitely huge you know mm. making sure that no matter what facet of the product it is right whether it's using it or trying to get support on it or even just trying to get more information on and actually how to utilize it to its full potential is massive for me so i thought that was actually a really good point that you brought up is like you know maybe we're not getting all the feedback that we want because there is this kind of unseen barrier that we don't have or that we're not seeing you know, yeah. not to be redundant right um <laughs> but you know we we just don't know that the problem is there right we kind of assume that you know oh well the user should just be able to get to it and you know uh why aren't they responding to us etc so um and it kind of goes back to something that we've talked about uh, about on the podcast before which is kind of taking yourself out of the idea that you are the user right even if you mm. are developing a product if you're going in and saying like these are all the features that we want at the end of the day you may not be the the end user for that product so you can't always assume you know that you know one set of values is going to be perfect for whoever is using it at the end of the day whether it's the product or support or anything else kind of tangentially related to it yeah yeah absolutely and that's i think that's why i love so much like involving cx in beta testing because um in my experience like you'll have you'll have something to test and then often um my teams who've, who've done uh been involved in, in beta testing have gotten sort of like a list of like okay here are the things we want you to test like here's the protocol like click these buttons do these things um and then what i always try to do is have like a little a little brainstorm um even like 15 20 minutes with the team members and say like okay how are customers gonna gonna break this um how are they going to misinterpret what it's for and try to use it for something it doesn't do and and like let's go test for that uh write down as many ways as you can think of um because they'll they'll have a lot of insight um in just the mindset of the customer and how they're thinking about uh, what they have access to, what you've given them access to. Um, it's also why I brought up and why I'm so excited to see people merging those data sets because there's going to be a blind spot in every single uh, area of serving customers, right? CX, ultimately, even though it's a department, is the responsibility of an entire organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all have to point out each other's blind spots. Um, customer facing teams have to point out uh the things that customers are are telling uh them they see uh to, to other teams who who don't otherwise get that information and likewise uh engineering and product teams who see where the hot spots are and like uh, people aren't using this feature you've got to tell the cx team that because you're absolutely right like the the problem might be that the feature is hard to use or it might just be that there's no documentation and people don't know it exists um, so I think the more integrated folks can get, um, it's why a voice of, voice of the customer program is so powerful is that's a, a great way to integrate and work together on those, those solutions. Yeah. We've yeah. seen a, a decent amount of integration with things like, um, for example, CRMs, like being able to know who's in beta programs, things like net promoter scores or any kind of satisfaction scores. And then also having that access to support tickets or just anything that we can kind of pull the thread on and say, what's going on with this user? Why, why are we getting adoption from this group for this feature set and not this group, right? And it's just like, there's, there's, there's so much in the data that we could use as long as these systems are communicating with each other because it's been a while since things were like super decentralized, but there's a lot of companies that still just haven't made that jump into like, okay, I'm going to start using this tool set or make sure I can connect these two things together. Yeah, um, yeah. 
the systems and the and the people too, right? Because there's there's definitely da- the data tells a story, but it's not a great storyteller on its own, uh, in my experience. <laughs> and so you, you need those people not who are yet. gonna, yeah. Can, <laughs> yeah, right, right, not yet. Uh, we'll get there. But for now, we need those people who can like look at it and say like, here's what I see, and there's what I see. I I always think of that. Um, that uh, that folk tale about the like the seven mice and the elephant and like each one thinks it's a different thing, and then finally one goes all the way around it and says like oh it's an elephant like that's the process we need to be doing uh, ultimately yeah. with, for each other to help yeah. us all see the elephant. Very holistic. Get all the voices in there. Get mm-hmm. as many perspectives as possible, and then yep, there's the complete picture. Yeah. Um, and speaking of integration, how early should that uh, conversation about customer experience start when it comes to product development? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'd say as early as as possible. I think, you know, if you're a, if you're a founder, you should be thinking about even if you're not hiring people for it, you should be thinking about um, the customer experience and like what your vision of that. Um, I think one of the best ways I've seen people think about it is like thinking about okay, you know, this is our company and this is our product, and then also customer experience is a product. Uh, that we offer. It's it's like a, an additional value add product um, that that people are just going to get um, because that puts you in a mindset to to think about it long term. So, and I've also noticed there's a there's a really interesting trend, um, and hopefully I don't get myself in trouble here. But oh well, uh, there's a, an interesting trend I've seen with with uh, founders. Um, it's a real fifty fifty. Uh, for founders who have provided support um, because some founders will like provide support for their product early on because like they're the person there so they're going to do it um, and I think that's really good and it can be really the the positive 50% uh, of that experience is like you get it you get how hard it is you get how taxing it is uh, you get how you know how the floodgates open when you release a new feature. Uh, and so you can like kind of file that away and remember that for the future. Um, the downside I would say is that like doing it once for your product uh, and and then considering yourself an expert, I think it's still really important to remember that there are there are people who are who are experts in this. And also to remember that like, to your point, you're not the customer. Um, and you're especially not the customer once you've grown to a point where you now have to hire someone to run your customer facing teams. Um, you can't expect those people to have the depth of knowledge that you did about your product uh, once you're once someone else is running support. Like it, it's just not reasonable. So there are upsides and downsides. I think more upside uh, than downside as long as you can kind of remember that stuff. But um, but a CX person, I think. I haven't been a founder before, so this is all conjecture, but like if I were mm-hmm. founding a company right now, um, I would try as early as possible to hire um, a, a CX professional um, who also had like a, a pretty decent uh, like product brain um, because you want somebody who's like really re- well-rounded to sort of like set the floor. Again, See if CX is a product, you need someone who can develop uh, and create that product for your company. Um, so yeah, I think as early as as possible, if you can start integrating it, especially if you can get someone who who knows their stuff, because then you know, a year down the road, three years down the road, when you're ready to build out a, a full scale team, even if it's only three or four people, you'll already have three or four years of tagged tickets and customer contacts and uh and things that are like organized and make sense uh you could you could start a voice of the customer pro- pro- program with minimal friction uh mm-hmm. as opposed to like waiting and then hiring somebody who's just going to tell you like yeah i can only tell you about what happens from like right now uh, yeah. uh into the future because everything before is just like lost and disorganized yeah. and we can't really do anything about that Proactive versus reactive, right? Exactly. And being exactly. able to have that kind of knowledge base built up. And it's like, yeah, these are the things that we're probably going to see. Um, sounds like also kind of being vulnerable and also very open-minded is also a, a big trait, right? That's kind of um, sensing a little a, bit of that. It's a plus. Yeah, I think like just having the humility to to 
um, that's another thing that like just broadly as I worked in the startup world is, is just a big strength that I, I always look for when I'm joining a new organization, um, is a, uh, uh, an organization that has a proven track record of having uh, a leadership team who ser- seeks out and hires experts and then listens to them. Because um, occasionally you find you find a leadership team who uh, will hire experts and then go like, interesting. Well, actually, I think I might be the yeah. expert. <laughs> about yeah. your Moving field. on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and at that point, like, why hire an expert? Um, yeah. You know, at least save your company some money and hire somebody cheaper. I don't know. That's there's yeah. there's paths for all companies uh, and and many of them successful, so yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. Having the mindset of being willing to listen, I think, is really really important, yeah. and uh, I think it runs parallel to everything that you're doing in customer uh, success and experience, and also a beta program, right? It would be strange to have a beta program and like you just said, you know, <laughs> bring in all the beta testers and they tell you what they think and you say, oh, interesting. Well, we're, we're, we'll launch it anyway. Well, so they're you know, just using fine. the tool yeah. wrong. You know, if they would just yeah. use it right, they wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I think also that's where the, the role of a really great beta program manager comes in, right? Being able to, you know, guide those testers who, you know, may have a, a you know, maybe not the best time using the tool or um, don't have the, the right footing when it comes to, okay, how should I communicate or what should I be providing, you know? having a person who can really guide them through the experience and be that bridge is also incredibly important. I think that's a theme that we've had on a couple episodes as well. Yeah. I mean, it's key. Like if you think about like a really, really great beta program manager, will also understand these aspects of things like CX and things like QA and things like just product development and a little bit of marketing. Like I'll throw, there's just like, you need to have this understanding because as a program manager, who am I, who should I involve? (laughs) Right. Like who, who, what, who should I get this data to? Right. So like I, I've talked about before, you're going to get things that people like inside of beta. Like you're going to get testimonials. You're going to get things that are useful and that should go to the marketing team. A, a bad program manager would just, you know, toss in the back saying like, whatever, bugs <laughs> go to engineering and that's it. Right. Yeah. If they don't fix it, it doesn't go anywhere else. It's just the black hole. A good program manager can say, how can I get the most out of this data that I'm I'm getting from this test, the CX team, the support team, these teams should have access to this data because I I have a, it's like my little pre-launch that I'm staring at here, right? This is what's going to happen after I launch this product. These things that don't work, things that work well, I need to get this to the right, the right hands. Um, And that's how how I was always seen like a good Peter program manager will, will know who to involve and at what stage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, at what stage is a good a good call out too, because I think that that's a that's a big piece of it and a tricky thing to figure out too, in my experience. Yes, it can it can be rough. I've I've seen some programs that come maybe a little bit too late, like they'll they'll include CX a little bit too late. I think there should be an aspect of um, when you're planning a test, keeping them in the know rather than just you know. I don't want to say like tossing it over the fence, but like saying like knock on the door and then throw it over, right? Like that's yeah. m- might be too late. Like, hey, yeah. here's great data, go use it. And yeah. Like, wow, well, I, I didn't have a plan for using <laughs> this. I, I'm I've been doing this other stuff, right? So there's the, the I think the right time to get people involved is in that planning stage. They don't need to be involved at every single point. Like, you may not need um, a supporter, a CX team member in every single meeting, right? Like going yeah. over the the weekly results. It's like they're not going to be able to take action right there. They might have a perspective, they might have an opinion, but we might be trying to avoid too many opinions at certain points and getting more action out of the stuff and utilizing, say, someone like in CX or in QA or marketing's specific skills for the things that they could use. So yeah. that's my rule of thumb for involving people at the right point. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of it boils down to um, to keeping people involved, certainly, but also just informed. Um, Mm -hmm. at like a, at like a high level, um, because to your point and to my, I think we're both, it's interesting, like all of the different broad disciplines that, that we're all here bringing up about like, you know, the ideal person in a CX or a, or a a beta test management position, like all these things are multidisciplinary at this, at this point. Um, at least if you're in a leadership position, um, 
so that informational aspect, the data aspect, the the knowledge sharing aspects are are so key. Like I'd say your first <laughs> your first order of business, if even if you don't have a CX department yet, is to just like make sure your departments are talking to each other and your people are talking to each other. Um, that's a pretty decent decent start. Um, yeah, that was something that uh, Lindsay really touched on. She was she's from Square. She runs their global beta program. And she was talking about like, you know, being able to be in there and kind of championing the voice of the customer and getting that data really um, like very readily available amongst all these other teams. And that allowed her team to go and be like, OK, you know, we're already kind of part of the conversation, you know, so we don't have as much pushback or we don't have as many misunderstandings from another team that, you know, like we mentioned earlier, might just say like, well, they're they're not using the tool right or, you know, what don't, what don't they get about the product, et cetera. So. I think that transparency is is incredibly important. Um, you know, if you're running beta product marketing, et cetera, you know, yeah. four and a half. Definitely like to get a, a bigger impact when you're transparent and like upfront with your objectives and what you're trying to do. I've seen like Colin, you mentioned earlier, like those continuous beta programs, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the best beta programs, the best recruiters you can find are your your account managers or your customer success teams. Mm -hmm. Like they know their customers right and mm -hmm. oh, they would be totally interested in this they'd be totally engaged in this and it's like they're talking to those people on a more regular basis like if i'm a beta program manager and i just go cold outreach to this random person they're like eh, they may not even see it may not be attention but if it's a direct message from an account manager or so? like a, a cs person it's just gonna have a way better impact i want those teams in these programs involved early way early like yeah. help me find people please especially in b2b it's so much harder to find testers and it's like you want to use your network in your company your colleagues that can help you have a better impact and that's just please do that if you're struggling to find testers reach out to those cs teams those account management teams and say here's what we're trying to do can you help me find people that fit this criteria yeah yeah absolutely and I, I, there there's also this very specific type of customer i i feel like that uh that those teams are really great at finding uh that's they can be kind of like a needle in a haystack and that's the like uh the engaged but upset but not a detractor customer um <laughs> so this like really beautiful venn diagram of like loves the product super engaged uh you know, believes in the mission, but also thinks your product kind of sucks. Um, yeah. It's just such a, a, a oh. beautiful customer to get a hold of for something like a beta test or, or something like that. I have it yeah. in my head right now. I have my, my list of, <laughs> <laughs> list of yeah, yeah, yeah. It's me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah, it's like they're just so incredibly passionate. Um, you know, uh, we were talking to Jake from Intel, and he said that those people were absolutely perfect. And they came through the channels that you're talking about, where it's you know yep. support or customer service, et cetera. And someone's just like, the product just isn't working. You know, help me get it going. And they kind mm -hmm. of do this sort of customer judo, where they take all that energy and just kind of push it in a positive direction. And those people end up being really incredible, you know, testers and uh, focus group people who are you know, in there constantly engaged. And then they bring in everyone else that they know as well, where it's like, yeah, I'm also a part of this group over here that would definitely be interested in giving you all this information. So uh, being able to perform that kind of transfer of energy from, you know, like you said, loves the product, but a little angry to, okay, I'm on board and I'm willing to help you, you know, help your organization build this out even better. Yeah, uh, a, a great way to start finding those customers too is to go to your uh, your CX managers and have them go to the agents and say like, tell me about the silliest workaround you've put together for a customer. <laughs> <laughs> and there they are, you found them. Perfect, yeah. Like you yeah. said, needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, Let's see, uh, coming up on, on time a little bit here. This has been a, a fantastic conversation. I love how we're intertwining beta and CX and customer support and product and all these teams. A um, couple more questions I want to ask you. What keeps you passionate about being in customer experience? You've been in the field for a while now. What keeps you motivated and, and still, you know, really passionate to be in the field? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little passe, but I, I think my primary answer is just like helping people. Um, mm -hmm. Every morning I wake up and I sit down at my desk and I, I help 
well, at this point, I don't usually directly help people, but I help people help people, uh, which is <laughs> just as rewarding, if not more. Um, so meta. But, yeah. <laughs> um, as, I don't know. It feels on brand for me. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I really enjoy that process. There's a, there's also a really fun, um, it's why I'm so, so interested in beta testing and like working with product and, and teasing out uh, all of these these puzzles um there's this this act that you do uh as a good cx manager of sort of like reading the air and teaching people to read the air even in in something as straightforward as a as a live chat conversation right um i remember a perfect example is i remember launching live chat um at a company that didn't have it yet um and i had an agent who was like really struggling with it and was like i just feel like I'm in these chats like forever and I can't close them out. And, and I, I, I just, I don't think I'm doing this right. And so I, I worked with her on a, on a couple of them. Um, and the solution we arrived at was like, oh yeah, your, your approach is a little off because at least in our company's case, live chat is different from email because email is where you solve the problem. Uh, cause we had sort of a complex software. Um, things took a while to tease out in, in many cases. Um, so what I had to tell her was like, live chat is is not that. It's not for solving the problem. Live chat is for getting to the problem. And mm-hmm. then you say, okay, great. I fully understand what's going on right now. Uh, let me go and, you know, check on a couple of things and get back to you in like half an hour and I'll, I'll send you an email um, and we'll finish this out. And from that point on where she, she was like, I get it. I've got it. Um, and so like that teasing out those puzzles and teasing out that, uh, that customer psychology, um, it is just like never going to stop being interesting to me. Um, I, just, I love that. Probably, probably the favorite thing, my favorite thing that you said earlier that like kind of stood out to me was that, you know, people don't, don't want to email you and it's not, some people do want to email you. It's just, uh, <laughs> I understood the point, yeah. right? So yeah. it's like, they may want it to chat with you. They may yeah. want they may want to call you. They may not want any interaction with your company and they're going to go on, you know, I, I think my first behavior for a lot of stuff that I use is going to be like, "Oh, I can't figure this out." I go into Google and I type in the exact problem I have. Yep. And then I just kind of I go through it self-serve. I'm a technical person. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty I'm pretty savvy. But then there's stuff that I just, I just don't freaking know. Like I don't mm-hmm. know some of this t- these technical tools that I need to go through and I'm just like S- help Somebody, yeah. somebody just helped me because I don't know enough about this to do it myself. So I'm going to go into a chat bot and say, or the chat bot and say, please help me find somebody to help with this. Or, you know, I'm going to do a little more due diligence. And it's like that orchestration, right? That, that there's a lot of, it's a symphony of support and resources you're providing to your users to, to give them a good customer experience. Cause it's not just phone support or email support or live chat support. It's like, no, nah, you got to. It's probably all of them because each problem needs to be solved in a certain way. Mm-hmm. Um, just kind of yeah. what you said were about the the chat, right? I'm getting to where the problem's at inside chat. Um, yeah. Sometimes I'll, I'll solve the problem in chat, but maybe I need to get somewhere else to to solve the problem. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really huge distinction for like modern CX uh, and and customer support that isn't again that that sort of like customer service where like we're going to throw a bunch of people at a call center who are going to give them a discount because they're really angry about this thing we're not going to fix. Um, there's a, there's another trend that I didn't bring up that I think is really exciting uh, because I've wanted it as a CX leader for a long time uh, is the the element of storytelling in CX. Uh, I think a lot of platforms are now referring it to it as like immersive experiences, but what I see it as is like, uh, on the agent side, being able to see the full story uh, of, you know, what was the customer doing before they reached out? Uh, you know, what page were we on? What, what buttons did we click? Um, who did they talk to before they got to me? And what did they say? Um, and offering that entire chain of events to uh, to really understand, first of all, why they're contacting you. Um, but secondly, like where they're at in the process of contacting you. For example, um, one of the reasons I have a bias against social media support is like social media is where your customers go to like 
how 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 do I put this for a for a podcast audience? <laughs> Uh, to light something in your office building on fire, uh, to let you know that there's something something bad going yeah. on, right? Like that's the only time I've ever gone to Twitter for customer support is when I've exhausted all other options, uh, and now I just need to like throw a grenade and be like, "This company sucks unless they help me in the next 15 minutes, and everybody knows about it now." <laughs> like that's what social media support is for. So again, it comes down to that that customer psychology of like. If if I get if I see a ticket and the 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 originating point of that ticket is a Twitter thread, I already know <laughs> it's bad news. Uh as compared to like yeah. an email or a live chat where it's like it's neutral, we're figuring it out, you know? Like yep, it's already, yep. you know, DEF CON five uh yeah there. Panic so. button was pushed. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Context. So that kind of figuring the, those kinds of puzzles out too, because it's different at every company. Um yeah. Figuring that stuff out is uh, just the context um, is a lot of fun for me. Always. Context is so huge. Like it, it's your next move. Like that's more strategic, right? Like if See? I can assess the situation and look at context, like I'm going to provide such a better experience. I, I have a, a a little tiny story. We were running a beta test once, and I'm on. We were actually running this on behalf of a company, so I'm running the test, and we're going through this bug, and we're bringing it up, and we're talking about it. And we click into that user to see what other bugs they submitted. And we actually had like all their feedback up and it was all submitted like in this nice little timeline of things that they had done. And like, it was this story, right? So we're sitting there on the call with the customer and we're like, oh, they did that thing, which screwed up these three other things. And now they're confused about this. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's why that's a problem because that one thing right there that one bug caused this whole trickle down effect of all these other problems and the user isn't determining that it's that the reason that's the reason right like they turned something off and now these four things aren't functioning properly it's like that context is so important for any kind of decision you're making we use data and insights to make mm -hmm. those uh help make those decisions and 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 that right there that is the new surprise and delight um, <laughs> once upon a time I worked for Starbucks and their whole thing was like surprise and delight, uh, the customer and like, it worked for them for a good long while. Like staff was friendlier than any other location. Um, you got more free stuff on occasion as a customer than like any place else. Um, but that, that sheen fades after a while. And I remember there's like still one of my favorite things ever published in, uh, Harvard business review, which makes it sound like I read it way more than I, I do. But uh, there was, there was a, uh, I can't remember who the author was, but they wrote this article about like, stop delighting your customers um, because it's just a, it's a false premise. Like you're jumping the shark. Uh, just show up for them is, is like mm -hmm. step one. Um, and I think that what you just described, having that full context to the point where a, a lot of business leaders interpret customers wanting to feel seen as things like you know knowing their uh, i don't know their favorite lunch item and their like dog's yeah. preferred shape of chew toy right like that stuff is all nice your customers are really going to feel seen if they can come to you with a problem and you can look at that that what you just described and say like oh yeah I can already see what's going on here. I totally get why this is frustrating. You're right. That sucks. Let me go in and fix this for you. Without them even having to to describe uh, maybe fully the, the issue that they're having. That's the new surprise and delight as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, 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 not having that seems so like, I don't want to say barbaric, but old, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I submitted, it is. it is. I submitted 10 tickets and I'm on this one now. Right, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'm, and you're like, well, have you done this thing? Like, no, I, I told you in this other ticket, and it's like, for some reason, these things don't communicate to each yeah. other, and it's like, what? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sending this information to you, or I'll pick up a. Oh, this one was the best. I picked up the phone and I was doing a support, and I gave them all this information. I'm like, okay, let me transfer you to this other team. I got transferred to the team, and they asked me the same damn questions and i'm like there's no <laughs> yep. freaking way i have yep. to do this again <laughs> yeah please please stop making me answer the same things i'm talking to the single company <laughs> yeah so. yeah and it's it's kind of it's kind of sad that like 
something I've just described as the new surprise and delight is like being functional uh, as a team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I do think that that's still the truth for uh, for a lot of technologies and a lot of companies, like even even larger companies. They're still figuring out. Um, and and some of it is because they've been focusing on these sort of like surprise and delight ele elements that are easier to do, but like ultimately more hollow and less helpful to customers. So mm -hmm. I think that's what I mean. Yeah, I'll take consistency any day over there you go. things like surprise. Like yeah. if I know that I can go get this thing answered or hashed out, I'd rather not have a really great one and a really you know bad experience right after. That's just not good. Bad taste. It removes that good thing that happened and mm -hmm. it's gone. Mm -hmm. So if you're aiming for that surprise and delight, hopefully that's not, you have peaks and valleys <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think all this was great answers to the question of what happens when you can no longer wow the customer, right? You know, yeah. you get that past that initial. It's like, hey, look how great it is. And the customer's like, cool. It doesn't work. What do we do now? It's like, oh, well, that's a good question, actually. So being being able to be kind of like that detective, you know, being able to sort out, you know, where do all the clues lead, you know, and being able to tell that story is is really awesome. So yeah. thank you guys for breaking that down. That was that was great. It's like um, a mar like CX. Good CX is a lot like marriage counseling, uh, you know, <laughs> where the company's <laughs> one party and the customer's the other, you know. Yeah. Just Listen, you're spark. both wrong. You got to find that spark again. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and sometimes that spark is just, you know, every Friday night is date night, whether or not you're in the mood to call it out in a date. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Consistency, yeah. like you said. Communicate. Yeah. It's like, can you tell that to the, the product team? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're saying Don't it tell to, to me. me. Tell it I to want them. you to yeah. say it to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, oh, man. And then on a fun note, which is always good. Um, last question I want to ask for you, Colin. Yeah. Um, What's some advice you give to your younger self? Get a comm sci degree. <laughs> uh, only kidding. Not not really. That might actually be uh, less relevant as as AI develops. But um, yeah. no, I think the 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 real advice is uh, two things. Um, you know, leave when it comes to to finding a job or a career. Uh, leave no stone unturned. There are so many. I I got into tech completely by accident. I got into customer experience completely by accident. I just happened to be uh, talking loudly about Sylvia Plath and playing banjo at a friend's bonfire at like the right day and hour, yeah. which is a story for another time. But um, <laughs> and, and and met my first my first uh, boss in in CX and tech um, at mm -hmm. that bonfire, and so. You know, there are so many jobs, so many positions, so many disciplines that I didn't even know existed uh, as a as a youth, um, and new ones uh, coming to the forefront every single day. Um, so yeah, leave no stone unturned. If there's if there's something you're good at and interested in, there is a job for that uh, somewhere. You just have to go out and and find it and take chances and meet people and uh, and and be open, uh, like you said. Um, and the other one is like those soft skills you have um, are perhaps mislabeled. Uh, um, mm -hmm. They're they're immensely valuable. Um, and I, I would say to my younger self, like, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, the 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 emotional. I think we've heard a lot over the last few years about like, you know, EQ this and, and uh, EQ that. And a lot of it is fluff, but mm -hmm. there is a lot of truth in there that people who um, who are emotionally intelligent and can, again, read the air uh, and communicate well and communicate at the right times uh as we pointed out earlier and and know when to bring people in and how to put people together and um those skills are just really valuable and less on hand than uh, at least i uh ever <laughs> thought yeah. uh that they would be so um yeah that's definitely some advice i would give my my younger self there's hope absolutely yeah <laughs> Resonates with me as someone who believes that they kind of also stumbled into tech and is incredibly grateful for it. I feel like those words 
ring true for sure. And like you said, it sort of all starts with empathy, right? Being able to have that empathetic mindset and listening and finding the value where others may not is is incredible. And I think that speaks to CX and beta and everything we talked about today. So uh, Colin, it was incredible having you on. Really amazing conversation. Um, just want to thank you again for being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a blast. Thank you for listening to the Delta Huddle podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave us a like or a five-star rating. You can also find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. We'll see you in the next episode and happy testing.